That is an interesting choice of keys. What is this middle mic one? This is a button for Cortana? Seriously? Cortana, open Adobe Premiere. I do not understand your request. Hmm, I guess that doesn't work. What about this? Cortana, what is the weather like in New York? The weather in Seattle is wet. Um, okay. Cortana, send message to Mike. Do you require emergency services? What? No. Okay, calling 911. No, Cortana, no. Abort, abort. Don't do that. Welcome to the channel, guys. This is Scott. Why they decided to put a dedicated Cortana button as default, I just don't understand. But you know what? It's pretty easy to swap out to something more useful, so not a huge deal. So I call this video the three-peat, and for a reason. So Q3 is the third board out of the Q series, and Q1 and Q2 were really great boards, and this overall trend continues with the Q3. So Keychron does it again with a nicely designed, feature-packed TKL this time, with great typing feel and sound. So before we move on, let me show you this. Check this out real quick. It's also a 3 p because some of the quirks you have seen with the Q1 and Q2 are also shared here as well. If you recall, the Q1 was a fairly pingy board, and you were able to fix it fairly easily, but it was definitely there. Q2 alleviated this issue with a built-in force break and a thicker case. Oddly enough, I feel like the Q3, maybe because of the size, shares some of these similarities more with the Q1 than the Q2. Once again, it's fixable, which I'm going to show you how, but at this point, I wish I didn't have to. Now, this might be subjective, but besides the odd buttons in the upper right hand corner, the other interesting design choice was the placement of the knob. From what I understand, the original Q3 design was made without knobs, but a lot of people wanted Keychron to add the knob, so they did. They stuck it right here. It's a bit odd in my opinion, but if you must have a knob, then here it is. I personally would get the knob free one, honestly. Just to me, it looks cleaner. But let's dive deeper into the Q3 now, shall we? As mentioned before, the Q3 is a TKL. It's the biggest of the Q series for now, and definitely is a hefty big boy. It carries with it the classic TKL look and function, and in addition, also keeps the familial look that began with the Q1. Overall, it's a good design, especially on the side profile. The Q3, like the Q2 and the Q1 before it, comes with the option of being fully pre-built, which means keycaps and switches. The version I have is black with the Keychron's own OSA profile caps. Overall, the caps are a medium weight PBT material, and the profile itself is fairly comfortable to type on. Not the thickest material, but it's better than the older ABS OEM caps they used to offer. The switches I have are Gateron Pro Reds. These are actually pretty smooth stock. In addition to the black, Keychron also offers the Q3 in both silver and blue as well, so check it out. As with the previous Q series boards, the stock Q3 has a nice flex and bounce to it thanks to its gasket mounted structure. Now if you recall, the Q1 sounded pretty weak stock. The Q2 was much better out of the box. Then what about the Q3? Let's check it out. As you can hear, the stock Q3 sounds like a blend of the Q1 and the Q2. It doesn't sound as full right out of the box as a Q1, but rather a bit more muted like the Q2 was. And remember what I mentioned about that ping? Check it out. Hmm, not what I was hoping for. So let's dig deeper into this and figure this out. Similar to the previous models, the overall bottom of the Q3 is a pretty simple and clean design with no logos or anything else. I do appreciate that Keychron still uses these beefy hex screws. As you take the case apart and get deeper into the board, you start to realize the similarities the Q3 shares with the Q1, like this. Like the Q1, the Q3's upper case rings pretty loudly. And from what I see, this is the major reason for that pinging or that weird sound that you hear. Here's an example of this. By just putting my hand on the upper chassis, the annoying ping pretty much goes away. Then the question is, 
what are those little silicone pads really doing? In my opinion, the silicone isolators that they have applied are a little too thin, so when you screw the two halves together, the metals end up touching each other anyways, allowing the energy to transfer from the lower to the upper. So I'll show you how to take care of this. The interesting thing is, if you recall, my Q2 never came with the built-in silicone force brakes. I think for my sample, they forgot to put it in. So you know what, at the end of the day, I ended up using the trusty tape force brake mod and it worked really well. In my opinion, I feel like the tape force brake mod is actually more effective than the silicone built-in ones. So we'll test that theory out later. With all the keycaps and switches removed, you can start to see the additional details. Unlike the Q1, the Q3 uses a steel plate. This is actually the same as the Q2. There's a reason for this and I'll get into this later. And like the Q2, the Q3 also comes with a dense plate foam to dampen the plate resonance. This is actually really important for this board. Beyond that, you have the lower case with this thin foam. Pretty much standard stuff and very similar to the Q2 in this case. Also, a reason for why this foam being so thin as well. If you recall, I used the thin 50mm kill mat on my Q1 to eliminate the annoying case resonance. However, I realized that the Q3 doesn't have as much space inside as the original Q1 did, which means that if you do use the kill mat, you pretty much lose all the flex. So we need to mod this without using kill mat for this Q3. But the question also is, does it really need it? Q2, I did add it in, but I could have probably done without. So moving on, the PCB is very similar to the previous Q1 and Q2, nice and black with per key RGB. It also uses the same Gateron hot swap sockets as they did on the previous Q series boards as well. One thing I do like is how Keychron puts the reset switch in a very accessible location, perfect for QMK flashing. The stabilizers are the same as the ones in the Q2, made in-house by Keychron and no longer by Gateron. They are okay. Like the previous Q boards, the Q3 also uses the same daughter board setup and has the ability to swap between Mac and Windows, which is great for dual users like myself. And like the Q1 and Q2, the Q3 also has VIA and QMK compatibility stock in order to help you fully customize the keyboard to your liking and get rid of those weird buttons like the CUD, Cortana, and RGB. So now we have gotten the keyboard details out of the way, let's go into what we can do to fix some of these quirks. But before I do that, a quick word from our sponsor today, Bai. So what is Bai, you ask? Well, Bai is a service that allows you to buy cool stuff straight from Japan. You know there are Japanese-specific sites like Mercari, Rakuten, Yahoo Shopping Japan that will only ship domestically within Japan. However, Bai is a proxy service where those sellers will actually ship to, then Bai will arrange for shipping the rest of the way to you, no matter where you are. So for example, I'm not much of a weeb, but I am a fan of some anime like Evangelion and Gundam. So if I want to buy an awesome Evangelion figurine for my desk, I can just check it out here, purchase it, then it'll be shipped directly to me via Bai, hassle-free. In addition, if you want to buy something pre-owned that someone in Japan is selling, you can use something like Mercari to buy hard-to-find or rare collectibles this way as well. So by using Bai, you pretty much could buy anything from Japan. There are just so many different stores and products you could actually browse from as well. I'll provide a link in the description below and you can receive a coupon for 2,000 yen towards your first purchase from Bai. So check it out. So remember what I said about the case being shallow? If you decide to use kill mat in here, expect that you'll lose pretty much 90% of the deep flex of the Q3. So what do we do? Well, the secret to this is actually in this plate. Keychron decided to use a steel plate for a reason. Steel is heavier material than aluminum, and with the same amount of key type energy, it's also more difficult to excite to resonance. Using a dense plate foam as well, it's also even more difficult to make the plate ping and resonate. The interesting thing about the Keychron Q designs is that the majority of the pinging noise actually comes from the top. For the Q1, I used the force brake to literally break the transfer of energy from the lower case to the upper. From the Q2 and on, the Keychron added their own silicone force brake pads, but I feel like this is not as effective. 
The reason is that once you assemble the two halves and tighten the screws down, the silicone is fully compressed and the upper and the lower case makes full contact anyways. While the silicone help to reduce the transfer of the vibration energy, it still manages to travel from the two case surfaces touching. So what happens if I use a tape force break? I place two layers of masking tape between the upper and lower so that I'm reducing or eliminating the actual physical contact. This creates a true force break. So what about that thin foam? I say leave it. Why? Well, it's time for a quick technical segment. As mentioned before, I started to work with the sound and vibration isolation mechanical engineer Evan from Australia to get an expert's feedback in terms of the keyboard sound dynamics. I'll put his Instagram information in the description below, so quickly check it out and give him a quick shout out as well. So what we want to achieve is to be able to provide some science behind why our keyboards sound and feel this way. So if you remember what I said about the existence of airborne and structure-borne sounds, well, the foams, especially open cell foams, are effective against controlling or reducing airborne sounds. Also, if you recall, thinner foams are effective at reducing higher frequency sounds and much less effective at low frequency sounds. So what about something like thick silicone pads or silicone fillers or even something like Kilmat, which is actually a butyl rubber? Well, what these more solid fillers are doing is actually working to reduce the structure-borne sound by absorbing the vibration energy that is going into the case from the key press. So think of it this way. If you took a hard metal pipe and drop it on a hard floor, the force will cause the pipe to resonate at its natural frequency. However, if you take that resonating pipe and grab it with your hands really quick, your soft hand will help to absorb the vibration energy and the pipe will go silent. What Kilmat and silicone does is actually this. So effectively, they have different purposes. Foams will reduce airborne sounds while the solid fillers help to reduce structure-borne sounds. So if you have a pingy board, use something like silicone or Kilmat to reduce it. If you have a hollow sounding board, that's when you use open cell foams or like polyfill to help reduce the airborne sounds reflecting around the inside. I mean, you can still use solid fill to reduce hollowness by also removing the interior volume, but you will also be removing a lot of the keyboard's intended sound design as well. It's also not to say that solid fillers won't do anything against airborne sound, which it still will because softer surfaces can help absorb some of the airborne noise also and vice versa with light open cell foams. It will also help to reduce some structure-borne sound. But the story is, is that one type is actually better than the other at a specific job. So find the right tool for the purpose. A simple rule of thumb to determine what the filler will be effective against. If you take the material and blow into it, and if your breath goes in or gets dissipated away, it will control airborne sound better. If you feel your breath kind of bounce back and comes right back in your face, it'll be much more effective against structure-borne sound. So I know that's a simplified explanation, but hopefully that kind of helps. Now that we have more knowledge around these fillers, let's go back to modding. So we took care of the pinging with the tape force break mod. We also know that the dense plate foam with the steel plate is also reducing a lot of the vibration energy. So at this point, we have eliminated the Q3's bad noise. Now let's try to shape this to make some good sound. Given the design, the Q3 is not a very vibrant board like the original Q1 was. The original Q1, the first batch is what I'm referring to, has great lively sound which gives the board so much character. The Q2 and the Q3, with more denser materials and the steel plate, not as much. So let's see what we can do to make it a little bit more vibrant then. For this, I'll be going back to this, the tape mod. It filters out certain frequencies, emphasizes others, and provides an overall deeper, lower frequency keyboard. So if you don't like these mods, you don't have to use it. If you like some and not all, that's completely up to you as well. So for me, I felt that this was what was needed for my Q3. Now with that done, I'm also going to switch up the switches. Switch up the switches, that's a new one. I'm going to use the Gateron Box Ink Blacks. I had great luck with these on the Q2, so I want to repeat that once again on this Q3 as well. A nice, subtle, deep sound. And for the keycaps, I'm using the Whale keycaps from Polycaps. Although the Keychron OSA profile caps aren't bad, I do prefer the overall feel of a nice and thick cherry profile cap. The final result is great. And by picking and choosing different solutions, we were also able to keep the flex of the Q3 intact. So check this out. Now you got a sneak preview of the sound earlier. So now let me show you the full typing test.
What do you think? For me, I think this is the perfect Q3 that I can use and enjoy. Your version may be different and mod it accordingly to create your own shape for the sound for your own personal Q3. The Q3 will be going on sale today, March 29th, as an in-stock board with great inventory. The bare bones will be going here for around $154, and the fully built one with switches and keycaps for $174. I'll link that in the description below. In conclusion, what Keychron did was bring out a nicely featured, cleanly designed TKL with a great foundation for modding at a friendly price. I know there aren't too many attainably priced TKLs out there, so the Q3 is a welcome addition to the growing Q family and for this hobby as well. If you're still here, thank you for watching until the end. I really appreciate your support to help this channel grow. Thanks.